Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and our talks with Walt as we are calling them. We will now turn to poem number two of the inscription section at the very beginning of the deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass. This one, as I pondered in silence, and notice the spelling of pondered. It's what we will call an elided verb, and especially used uh, by Whitman. He loves this in the past tense. We'll have more to say about that one in a bit. But first of all, let's get to the assumptions that this lecture is built on. We always like to remind you that we are uh, posting all of our stuff there at learnstrong.net. Down that left-hand side, you can find the talks with Walt uh, and I'm hoping, my assumption is that you've watched a number of our previous lectures, especially because we're into this uh, inscription section, just to remind us that we are the stories we like to say in 303, the stories we tell and retell, the stories, of course, we accept, and in many ways, the stories we reject. Also, our assumption is you're familiar with our learning theory. We are always connecting new to old, as we say, the new is the new, the N-E-W is the K-N-E-W. And of course, our annotative approach, we're always reading and we'll look at, uh, we'll look at this text as well from three different levels, answering three guiding questions. At level one, what does the text say? Summary. At level two, what does the text mean? 2A themes, messages, uh, and, it to, and it to be rhetoric, not what is said, but how it's said. We already mentioned elided, for example. What's right there in the title? What's up with that interesting spelling to try and capture some of the American vernaculars we'll sometimes talk about it. And of course, we've talked at LearnStrong.net about how Twain plays a similar kind of game. And finally, at three, uh, level three, we're asking, how can I relate to this information in some meaningful way? Of course, relating to other texts, and it, since we're now into the inscription section, we'll ask, well, what, what is poem two ha, 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 in any way related to poem one? Is, and, and we'll play that game all the way through these 24 poems of the inscription section. Um, and then finally, and most importantly, can I relate in any way this information to myself? Hey guys, if we're doing anything, and I hope, I hope we're doing something in our talks here with Walt, if we're doing anything, I hope that each one of these poems you can own in some way, right? It becomes yours. Whitman himself would have been pleased with that attempt. Uh, it's not that we're going to understand everything about these poems or whatever, and I hope that we'll get below the epidermis, of course, of each of these poems, but ultimately I hope something you read will move you, challenge you. Finally, our assumptions of the Big Five. What does this text say about epistemology? What you can know, especially the fallibilist position. I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. That epistemological position of knowledge. Ontology, who I am and who, uh, and, and, and who we are. Um, of course, psychology and sociology, the study of the individual mind, the collective mind. And then finally, for Whitman, so huge, the question of theodicy. That is to say, why did this happen not to me, but rather for me? Finally, the assumptions here as well are that the five P's, or the five perspectives on Whitman. Whitman as person, as poet, as pedagogue or instructor, as teacher, as politician in his love of democracy, and then finally as philosopher, from the pre-Socratics and Socrates all the way through to the time of Emerson. Let's turn now to some background information as we follow a normal rhythm with each one of these lectures. This one first published in 1871. Think about that date. Obviously, after the Civil War, we're going to have something to say about war in this poem. Uh, and uh, in many ways as well, the whole destiny of Leaves of Grass, right? Um, in, in some ways, this is the point, right? First, we will see the first use of the italics here, okay? Um, and this one is going to get used often, so we're already making a 2B observation about italics. He's going to play this game in Song of the Redwood Tree, Out of the Cradle Endlessly Rocking, Out of the Rolling Ocean, and then most importantly, when Lilac's Last in the Dory are going, we'll, 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 um, we'll notice his use here. Here, it's in the form of question and answering. Now, one of the things about Whitman's biography that's important is that he has a background out of, out of a heretical Quaker sect, um, uh, uh, Elias Hicks and all of that. And one of the interesting things about certain religious communities is that they like that back and forth where, for example, someone in front of the group will say something and then the rest of the group will respond. There are, in fact, several psalms that are written, psalms from the Bible that are written this way. And so this is an ancient tradition where you're going to have an ability to kind of talk or communicate with yourself. Now, we're going to see this a lot in Leaves of Grass, which is why I'm pointing it out now. Okay. Now, the, the background here to this poem that I want to really emphasize comes from Emerson's great essay, Poet where he asks, and we've given lectures on all of the Emerson lectures, uh, 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 Emerson essays, including this one, The Poet, where he asks, where is the American epic, and who is the American poet that will write the American epic? 
And in some ways, it's clear that Whitman thought, maybe it's me, maybe it's me. As I pondered in silence, again, the, the, uh, the elided verb here, again, captures the spelling of pondered, notice, right? Instead of the E, the E gets dropped to try to capture some sense of how it might be pronounced by Americans especially. Let's just read now. As I pondered in silence, returning upon my poems, considering, lingering, long, a phantom arose before me with distrustful aspect, terrible in beauty, age, and power, the genius of poets of old lands, as to me directing like flame its eyes, with finger pointing to many immortal songs and menacing voice. What singest thou? It said, Knowest thou not there is but one theme for ever enduring bards? And that is the theme of war, the fortune of battles, the making of perfect soldiers. Be it so, then I answered. I, too, haughty shade, also sing war and a longer and greater one than any waged in my book with varying fortune, with flight, advance and retreat, victory deferred and wavering. Yet, methinks certain, or as good as certain at the last, the field, the world, for life and death, for the body and for the eternal soul, lo, I too am come, chanting the chant of battles, and I, above all, promote brave soldiers. Now we're going to pause at the very beginning of this poem and point out that the poem will begin in silence and end in chanting and in song. Typical Whitman loves like Blake to play around with these opposites. Go back to some of our lectures on Blake. We, of course, talk about the power of Taoism and the Taoistic thought that will influence Blake, the yin-yang symbol and all of that. So we're moving from opposite to opposite over and over again. So notice we'll start in silence, we end in song, we end in a promotion of the soldier. Now, of course, Whitman is a contemporary of Longfellow, and so go back and look at our lecture on Psalm of Life. Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream, for the soul is dead that slumbers and things are not what they seem. In this let feel life lighter, in this world's broad field of battle, in the bivy whack of life, be not like dumb driven cattle, be a hero in the strife. This notion that life is like a battlefield, let's go ahead and begin there with our symbolism. Notice he begins. Pondering. Now this is a Typical Whitman-esque word, ponder, to think, to consider. And this is one of the reasons why we love to read Leaves of Grass, because he wants you to read a poem and then take a walk. Go out and loaf, as he will say it, relax. Look up at the sky, look at a tree, enjoy the mountains, enjoy the, 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 the water, the sea, the, the rivers, the creeks, and then begin to think. As I pondered in silence, and then he says it, returning upon my poems, which is, of course, this book, considering, notice the ING's in three of them, the words, considering, lingering long, a phantom, notice capitalized, arose before me with distressful aspect. Now, of course, this phantom will make us immediately think of the great heroes of epics that are often going to fight against some kind of monster. Notice here, though, the phantom is going to be, maybe we would argue, self-doubt. Now, Whitman is always engaging in these kinds of, you know, back and forth. So of course, we're familiar with this idea of self-doubt. We saw it in our study of Shakespeare and his sonnets. We saw it, of course, in our study of Milton and his sonnets. That, the, uh, that question about, what if I'm not good enough? What if my project doesn't quite work? And of course, as we've pointed out with our Milton lectures, what if I go blind and then, of course, um, uh, when I consider how my light is spent then I, and, and i got to deal with that kind of question. Notice the phantom is terrible and then we have another set of threes. In beauty, in age, and in power. By the way, here, terrible means not just like bad, but frightening or challenging, right? The genius of poets of old lands. And this is, in fact, the phantom. In other words, standing behind all of the enterprises that for Whitman will be leaves of grass are the voices of all those who came before. The challenge. And of course, we, we go back to our comments about Dante, and of course, Whitman is playing in the, in the tradition with Dante and others. Notice it's Dante who, play, who lives in the shadow, we might say, of Virgil, and, and on and on it goes. As to me, directing like flame 
its eyes. And we're thinking here of our Milton again, and of course our Dante. In other words, it's terrifying, it's horrifying. With finger pointing to many immortal songs and menacing voice. In other words, okay, so you are trying to put together an American epic. And when Whitman consciously is doing this, and then he says, this phantom is challenging me in some way, saying, are you serious about this project of the epic? Because i got to tell you something about epics. And then, of course, in italics, to give us the voice, and the voice says, what sayest thou? It said, knowest thou not there is but one theme forever enduring Bards. Now, this is genius, and it's a whole lot like the game Dante plays, where he puts himself in the poem, and you'll remember in Limbo that he's, of course, going to walk up on some great poets who will then qualify Dante as a great poet. Notice here, very subtle, it's genius the way Whitman will do this, where he seems to suggest that he, maybe someday, will be considered an ever-enduring bard. Of course, the fact that we're spending time talking about him now proves the point that he was right all along. But there's something genius about this, right? He, the Phantom will say, the only thing you should ever concern yourself with if you're going to write an epic is war. Now, of course, this is why the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid often take such hits. We've of course, given full lectures on every line of those poems at LearnStrong.net. And of course, we're very susceptible and open to the argument against those, Ill th those epics as being just songs of war. And yet, of course, they're about so much more than that. But notice the great theme, the theme of war. The theme of war, the fortune of battles, the making of perfect soldiers. We think about Plato's Republic, of course. We think about Mushashi and Book of Five Rings. We think about Sansu's Art of War and books of strategy and warfare. And now the answer. So Whitman is now going to respond to this phantom. Now this is, of course, what we call in our discussions of compositional rhetoric as we study the great American th uh, thinker uh, Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence, the consideration of the historical precedent, that which came before, and conceding to the acrimonious audience some point. In other words, you're saying something to which the acrimonious audience will probably agree. What is the acrimonious audience? They're not going to agree with you. In other words, Whitman starts his collection of poems by realizing there's going to be some people who are offended. And of course, by 1871, people were offended, obviously, by previous uh, publishings of Leaves of Grass. So the response, I, too, haughty shade, also sing war. By the way, notice no commas up until the word war, although obviously it makes sense to have some of them there. And a longer and greater one than any. In other words, the suggestion here seeming to be I've got a poem and a collection of poems that's greater than anything that's been done. Now, where did he get that kind of arrogant idea from? Obviously, Milton's Paradise Lost. Go back to our opening lines there. Unattempted, things unattempted yet in prose and rhyme. And here, Whitman's playing a very similar game. Notice he uses the verb waged in my book. Put it in your notes. Leaves of grass will be a waging of a certain kind of contest, or war is what he calls it, with Varying fortune, there's your epistemological fallibilism, I'm not sure if it's going to work out, with flight, advance and retreat, victory deferred, by the way, notice again the alighted verb at the spelling of deferred, and wavering. In other words, this is going to be a series of poems, he's telling us, that will enjoin that very notion of what we think of in the battlefield, where you have surging forwards and backwards. Of course, this is why he will love the word picture of waves, because it works so nicely for him. Yet, notice in parenthesis, he makes a little kind of uh, an aside. Yet me thinks certain, hopefully, again the vowel, vowel was position, or as good as certain at the last, in parenthetic, hope in other words. In other words, Whitman is saying, I hope that my book is at least read and understood as a great struggle. You'll remember, of course, that he says it in Song of the Open Road. Now understand me well, it's providing the essence of things that no matter how great success, a greater struggle is necessary, and so we're going to be playing the game here. The field, the world, for life and death, for, notice it's capitalized, the body and for the eternal, again capitalized, soul. Lo. And now this word lo is an interesting word, of course, it's a religious word, and it just simply means listen for a second, right? Pay attention. I and I too am come, of course, the opening word in the very, in the very epitaph. We'll, we'll see the word come over and over and over again. Chanting the chant of battles, I, above all, promote brave soldiers. Now, you cannot, cannot help 
But notice in a set of lines like this that we've got to remember Achilles sitting in Iliad 9. There in his tent having those, what we call his spiritual crisis. Go back and look at those lectures again to feel confident with some of that stuff. Now what's he doing? He's withdrawn from the battle. He will not fight along with his, with his pal Patroclus there in the tent. And what is it that he's doing? He's singing songs about great warriors. Of course, we have here Whitman paying very close attention to this kind of thing. Well, at 2A, what are we going to say about a possible message here? Well, true living is true battle, right? That is to say it's a struggle. Life is a struggle. And as we have said many, many times in 303, it is the challenge to get through the struggle. Or as Dante points out, you don't go to hell, you go through hell, right? You, to get through to the other side on your way through purgatorio and finally paradise. At 2B, we mentioned the, of course, the elided verbs, usually in the past tense, to capture that American vernacular as Twain, of course, will play the game. Notice again the use of the parenthetics as well as the italics and as well that conversation back and forth. We're going to see so many of these kind of conversations. We're setting ourselves up. I've mentioned at 3A, Longfellow's Psalm of Life, Be a Hero in the Strife. Obviously, all of the great epics from Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, as well as Virgil's Aeneid, as well as Babel. We've given full lectures on all of those, and it's, of course, a great advantage to have had that background knowledge when one picks up Leaves of Grass. I like to think now, though, with you about Plato and Republic 7. You'll remember the cave allegory. Into the cave one goes to emancipate a young man, and, of course, out of the cave he is dragged, kicking and screaming, overcoming what two things in Plato's pedagogy? Fear and pain, the struggle, right? That is to say, a strug greater struggle is always necessary. The, the, the lines that we quoted already from Song of the Open Road. Well, a, a set of lines we'll get to later. Finally, in 3B, question, do you agree that life is in fact something to be fought or conquered, struggled through, or is it rather something to be discovered and enjoyed? Or can it be both of those two things? Well, I will leave that question to you. And I hope you'll come back for our next conversation with Walt. Thank you.